Hey everybody, welcome back to Art by Galen. My name is Galen Eilenfeldt, and welcome back to Creating Comics Start to Finish. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about planning and sketching the pages of your comic. So now that you've gone through the act of coming up with your concept and writing out your script and getting your dialogue and all the action and everything ready, now we're going to start talking about turning that into the actual pages of your book. Now, we don't want to jump straight into drawing the full-size pages just yet because we need to work out some of the compositional issues and we need to make sure that things are going to fit on the pages the way that we intend them to. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and thank our sponsor, Comics Wellspring, for supporting this video series. If you're not familiar, Comics Wellspring is a comic printing company. They do all different types of comic printing, trade paperback printing. They do trading cards, flyers, sketch cover books, stickers, you name it. They even do gear for your convention booths like pop-up banners and tablecloths and things like that. So when you're looking to get your next comic printed, visit comicswellspring.com. And here's a code to get a discount as well. What are the reasons that you want to do preliminary sketches before you actually start on your full-size pages? Number one, you want to focus on figuring out the layouts, the compositions. You want to make sure that everything is going to fit on a page in a way that makes sense without being too cluttered. And keeping it a rough sketch allows you to solve these problems long before you ever start worrying about detail. And doing that's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Now, when you're working with your preliminary sketches, the size and the resolution of your pages is not as important as when we get into developing our final pages. In the future, when we talk about penciling the pages and getting the actual final artwork into development, we will discuss more about resolution, page size, and using the proper templates to get started. But for today, all you're really going to need is something that is roughly comic book proportion. Now, if you're working digitally, it's pretty easy. You can just start right off with the proper templates. That way you don't veer off into the wrong size or the wrong resolutions. I actually have a starter pack on my Gumroad store that you can use. It's free. It comes with some templates. It even comes with some free comic brushes that I made for Photoshop. I've also got a link down below to Comics Wellspring's website and the templates that they recommend as well. But before we get to that point, let's talk about if you're going to be sketching out your comics traditionally. Uh, now, you can use a regular sketchbook if you want to. If you want something a little bit more geared towards making comics, I've got an awesome creating comics workbook. It's got pages where uh, you can sketch out your characters. You can have details about your characters. It's got pages for sketching out and planning your covers. It's got page one of your comic, and it's got enough pages in here to do a full issue of your comic. And if you look real closely, you can actually see it's got very light guidelines to help you with planning out your panels and getting everything drafted into your roughs. It's also got an area for notes and for writing scene descriptions and things like that. And I tried to lay it out in a way to where it even made it easy to do rough two page spreads as well. Now you don't necessarily have to go that route. You can also just use a simple sketchbook that is roughly comic book proportion. Like this one's a little bit smaller. And this happens to be the one that I've used to sketch out uh, Baku issues three and four. And you might be wondering, well, Galen, you've got this fancy new workbook. Why aren't you using that? And to be honest, I had gotten most of this done for issue four. Issue three was done a long time ago. Um, and most of this was done before this workbook was even a concept. So that's the only reason that I'm still using this book, because I want to keep it all in one place. But you'll notice right away that these are not detailed drawings. These are very, very rough. One of the main benefits to drawing rough like this is when I'm sketching out these pages, I can solve the problems and the compositions very quickly. And if I decide I don't like this, I can erase it out and redraw it without feeling like I've wasted a bunch of time doing a lot of detail and things like that. If I pull in the final page for this sketched out page, you can see there's a vast difference in the level of detail, but the overall composition and layout are pretty much the same. You know, we've got Penelope here, we've got a detective across the table, We've got the body posture of him leaning forward and being kind of intimidating. Then we, we turn the table around. We've got Penelope over on the left this time, and she's handcuffed to the table. And then we've got the guy, you know, more of a back shot. And we can see this dramatic kind of lighting in the room, which was intended from the beginning. Now, I don't need to worry about trying to figure out lighting and things like that necessarily in these rough sketches. But even in the roughs, you can kind of get the hint of where the shadows and everything were going to be. 
And just to make this even more clear, like if we look at the level of detail in his face here and in the rough, the rough is incredibly rough. It's not detailed. I haven't gone to the trouble of even sketching out fingers and things like that on his hands. It's just placement. You'll also notice that I've put in kind of rough areas of where the speech bubbles are going to be. And planning my pages around having the speech bubbles in place already, that allows me to create a panel that's designed to have space for these speech bubbles already, and I'm not going to accidentally have to cover up something that I spent a lot of time on because I didn't plan it ahead of time. So regardless if you're working traditionally in a sketchbook, in my workbook, or digitally, let me share with you some tips that you can use while you're working on sketching your pages out. If you're working digitally, keep the page size on your screen small. Keep it small while you're doing your roughs. This will keep you from even being able to waste time doing too many details. It'll allow you to rough a page in quickly and see it from a distance to see if the composition works. An important tip is to use references. And this is especially true if we're talking about things that you're not very confident with drawing. Now references will help even something that you are confident because it's gonna give you, you know, real world information on how to translate something visually into your comic. If you're not very familiar with drawing a particular thing, go to Google and just, you know, pull some references or even just take out your phone and take some reference photos yourself and just give yourself some sort of resource. One thing I do on a very regular basis is I take photos of my hands in different poses and resting on things. And um, a lot of times I'm asking my wife to model her hands for me too, like if she's like have her holding something a particular angle, because hands are something that I have a problem with, with most of like crazy angles. I have a few default poses that I kind of accidentally go to on a regular basis, but um, for something that's more complex, I'm almost always taking reference pictures for hands. Another thing is to keep your page flow in mind. You always want to make sure, think about left to right, top to bottom, you know, because your panels are going to be read in that order. And within the panels themselves, they're going to be, you know, left to right, top to bottom as well. And so I've got some examples here on, on the screen. I'm going to kind of show you and so you'll see here we've got this page broken into four panels and we've got seven total speech bubbles. And I've got them numbered in the order that you're going to read them. You'll notice that speech bubbles number one and number five are on the right, but because they're higher up than the other bubbles within the panels, those are going to be read first. But just keeping in mind the order in which people are going to generally read the panels and read the bubbles within the panels, it'll help you to make a more uh, easy to understand page. I'm going to give you some good and some bad examples for this tip. And this tip is to make sure you've got at least one background shot per page because you want your readers to always know where the story is taking place and where these events are unfolding. So here we've got two panels that have no background, uh, but they follow a panel that has a very detailed background. So we establish here that it's a classroom setting. We've got the professor up front and we've got Penelope sitting right down here. And so, because there's no shift in background and we see the professor and we see Penelope, we can infer that the scene hasn't changed. And so even though this is technically kind of lazy by not having any background, it still works. This page, there's four panels and each panel is a different setting. The first one, we're at a train station. The second one, we're inside of a train passing by part of a city. The third one, we're outside of a skyscraper like an apartment building. And the fourth one, we're inside, no, I guess it's fourth and fifth panels, I'm sorry. Uh, but these two are inside the apartment building, and, and it's coming up on an apartment door. And so each of these has a background. You, you get the sense of, you know, movement in the story. But once we get to the next page, this is a not-so-great example. We've got Luke in an elevator. We've got him coming into his apartment where Penelope's waiting for him. We have no background. We have no background, no background, no background, no background, no background. So we can guess that we're inside the apartment, but because there's no furniture, there's nothing to help us understand what the inside of this room looks like, we're not even really sure what kind of a room it is. That's a mistake on my part, and it's something that I pay very close attention to now because I recognize this mistake after it went to print. And even in the whole next page, like there's a little bit of a background here, but because there is quite a bit of text, you don't really see much of it. And this background is, there's a little bit of a bed. And so that's the only clue until the, 
the the next page into it that you're in like any kind of living quarters at all. Every page needs at least one background on it. You also need to have background whenever you have a scene change. Next, we're gonna talk about a few different things. We're gonna talk about page turns, we're gonna talk about splash pages, and two page spreads. Now a page turn is when you turn, you turn the page and then there's a reveal. So like here, this is a good example of a page turn. We've got, you know, Penelope is skating, she crashes, I apologize for the glare. She crashes her skateboard, she, she hits this mailbox and it crumbles because she hits it so hard and she blacks out. And then this is the page turn. We turn the page and there's a reveal. Now it doesn't have to be a two page spread like this, but there's a reveal of something new and exciting or something new and surprising. Uh, so it's a good idea when you're planning your comics to save these big impact moments for your page turns. Now this is also the first two page spread of Baku. It's the first one of the series, and I wanted it to be big and dramatic because this is the first ever dream sequence in the book, because it is a book about dreams after all. Now, when you're planning your two-page spreads uh, digitally, it's pretty easy. You just you just double the the width of your of your sketch page. Um, if you're working in a sketchbook like this, uh, this is a planned out double page spread. I just draw them side by side. When we get into doing the final pages, we'll talk about how to properly set them up and make sure that they're going to be ready for print. Or, you know, if you're using the workbook, these are pretty easy too because the, the pages are laid out side by side to make it easy for you to do a double page spread if you want to. You don't want to overuse two page spreads or splash pages uh, because it can, number one, it can very quickly add to the page count of your book. And... You know, number two, it, it, it honestly kind of slows down the story progression a little bit, because if you have a lot of, you know, big full page, because uh, a splash page is essentially that, like you've got one full page of artwork. This is this would be a splash page. And so let me walk you through this little sequence here, because this originally was going to be a lot longer. So we've got in the dream world here, we've got the Baku and the dream emissary, and they're talking about Penelope. And he's talking about uh, getting the emissary to send Penelope into more nightmares. And, and she's like, okay, I'll send her into more. Count on it. And then we have a page turn reveal for... Um, we have a page turn reveal for the first nightmare of Penelope being drugged down uh, by some kind of mermaids or sea creatures or something. And then we've got two dreams on this one. So it's a, it is, it is still a splash page. We've got one nightmare of a plane crash. We've got another kind of a monster nightmare. We have another page turn and then another double nightmare splash. So we've got kind of a haunted house sort of nightmare and then a being chased by a dinosaur nightmare. Now, originally each of these was going to be a full page. So that means you would have one, two, three, four, five pages five full pages of art for those nightmares. And while that, while that might have been cool, that would immediately add you know, more pages to the book, which makes it uh, more costly to produce, both in the art side of it and in the production side of it. And it slows down the story. While it might be visually appealing, we have to be able to rein ourselves in and not to uh, overdo those pages. But again, this is going to come down to preference. It's just something to be mindful of as you're planning your pages out. Now, we've talked about it a little already, but I do want to touch on it again. It is important to plan your art with your speech bubbles in mind. Um, you can see here, you know, I've got little ovals and thought bubbles and things like that in place on each of these panels just to work out where parts of the conversation are going to go. That way, you know, when I come down and I reference my script, I can say, okay, the first portion of dialogue, I've got these numbered. So first portion is going here, second portion is here, three, four, five, six. And it helps to keep it organized and it helps to keep the page flow smooth. Now we've talked about it in some of the videos about writing and it's worth mentioning here as well because just as it is with writing your story, uh, pacing is important with the vibe of the artwork as well. So, you know, for instance, we've got We've got one whole scene 
in the beginning of Baku 3 that takes place introducing some new characters and it's inside of a prison. And rather than linger there too long, I want to just kind of pique people's curiosity. And then we jump immediately over to Penelope and Alessa. Um, they're out having like a spa day kind of thing. It's a constant movement of mood and emotion and action and uh, non-action, basically. And I try to keep that movement up and down and regularly flowing to keep the reader interested in the book rather than staying at one pace for too long. If we spend too much time on a conversation, it can get very boring and cumbersome to read. And if we spend too much time on an action sequence, it can get fairly exhausting. And so we need to keep the reader in mind while we're planning out like the pacing of those events. Now, I, I don't want to spoil too much of Baku issue number four, but I do have a page that I was going to show as an example and kind of walk you through my planning process for it. This is the page that I was sketching in the video earlier. And this one, I don't generally break mine down into panels in my script, even though I, I have demonstrated ways that you can do that. This is just how it's comfortable for me, because I find that when I do try to plan out my panels and then I start sketching them out, it almost always doesn't work for me. So I find breaking it into action beats and then as I look at it and I can start sketching and playing with it that way, uh, visually rather than in words. You just need to do it in a way that's going to be comfortable for you. So we've got a narration that I've added here and it says Penn has made her way to the house. And so we've got Penelope is standing outside the house. Broken mailbox visible next to her. And so this is a callback to Baku issue number one, when she's skating and she slams into that mailbox and it shatters. And then later on, she wakes up next to it and you see all these bricks laying around. And so here in issue four, she has returned to that house. Um, she rubs her head where her injuries were and thinks, I can't believe how hard I hit that damn thing. And so I've got a real rough sketch of the house. Um, and I've got the broken mailbox right here. I've got Penelope standing next to it, rubbing her head. Now this is a distant shot. It's meant to establish where we are, changing the scenes from what was before, and showing that Penelope is here. Penn is now behind the house, looking around a small set of stairs for a hidden key. And thinks, hidden key on the back porch. Bingo. So we've got Penelope. I've just got a silhouette because I don't really need details while I'm planning this part out. I've got a different looking porch than the front porch in this shot and some bushes and things and a light that is hanging here. And then the next panel, we've got her lifting up the mat on the porch and then she finds a key. And then in the next panel, I've got her uh, one hand turning the key in the lock and another one holding the doorknob. Now, none of that is actually spelled out in my script, but that's how I chose to represent it. Because I'm a solo creator, I can make these decisions without having to, you know, consult with someone else about it. But if you're working with another writer or if you're working with a team of people, it's good that everybody is on the same page before you start changing things up. Now, this is something that I chose to cut out. It says she walks through the house, dusty and dark, muted colors. I've decided to save that for the next page, just for continuity. Like, I want things to run in order. And I want this part to be shown before we transition inside. And so that was just a decision I made to cut that part out. So the next one we have, a shot from outside the house, shows the woman Alice who was meeting with Wyatt in jail earlier. She watched as Penelope went inside and then thinks to herself, something. And so I've got that same back porch. It's a more zoomed out shot. We've got some like a tree and a tire swing and some other shrubbery and things. And then we've got some bushes that are closer to the viewer, and we see a person kneeling down, peering over the, over the bushes. And that more or less gives me all I need. Like, there's not a lot of dialogue on this page, so I don't have to plan a ton of bubbles. There's going to be one either here or here, where Penelope is having the thought about the key on the porch. It'll probably be this one. And then here, we'll have one thought bubble for this character, which will probably be right here. And now... I have enough information here that I'm ready to take this into the next stage of actually drawing out the page with pencils. I sincerely hope that you're enjoying this video series. I'm having a lot of fun making it. it is, uh, it's a challenge for me to find ways to verbally articulate the things that I kind of 
tend to do on a regular basis with my book. But it's something I'm really enjoying doing, and I truly, truly hope that it helps and inspires you to want to make your next comic book. And I can't wait to see them. Uh, if you have any thoughts or input, please feel free to leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you think of the series so far. Let me know what you think of the content in it. Let me know if you think I missed something. I'd like to take a moment, too, and thank anybody who has supported me in the past by purchasing any of my comics, Baku Dreamwalkers, my new Creating Comics workbook, or by supporting me on my Patreon, which uh, I highly recommend, and I really... Truly, like if you if you enjoy what I do, I really try to make it a point not to ask too much for support or anything like that. I'm highly, highly thankful for anybody that chooses to support me in any way. And that includes just watching these videos or sharing them or dropping me a comment. I do not exclusively only appreciate the monetary support. Obviously, it's a great thing, but I recognize the fact that your time is the most valuable thing that you have. And the fact that you've chosen to spend any amount of your time with me and my content, that means the world to me. But I would like to ask that if you do truly enjoy my content, consider pledging on my Patreon, even a dollar. Every little bit helps. And you can get access to comic book pages as I'm working on them, both for Baku and for my new book, Crimson Hex. I also do monthly pinup illustrations, and uh, we do a monthly character creation thing with the community there. And I also credit all of my patrons at the end of my videos as well. Uh, but anyhow, that's enough pitching from me. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, keep creating and take care.